Welcome back to Calculus 3. I'm Dr. Jeff Grail. Today we're going to begin by talking about directional derivatives. The idea is as follows. Suppose you have some function z that is a function of x and y. And then on some domain, it'll output certain z's and you end up with a surface. If you're at some point and you want to know the slope as you move in a particular direction, u, we will insist that the vector u be a unit vector. We'll know, we'll investigate what is the slope of the tangent line as you move in that particular direction. We are no longer requiring that that direction be parallel to the x-axis or to the y-axis. Those were partial derivatives. Now we're going to allow the change to occur in any direction. And the definition is perhaps something you could construct on your own. The directional derivative of f in the direction u is denoted by d with a subscript of u and then f. You can evaluate that at some point x. And defined by, now this is what you might have guessed, it's the limit as h goes to zero. Go figure. We're going to take x and we're going to perturb in h units in the direction of the vector u. So this will be the difference in the heights of the function at different points as we move in that direction. And we'll divide by how far we've moved, h. So this is our definition for the directional derivative. I'd like to point out that if we look at the function f of x plus t times u, we're putting a curve, a straight line in the domain, in the direction of u that passes through x. When we evaluate the function there, we'll have the heights all along that curve. If we take the derivative with respect to t and evaluate it at t equals u, we should get the slope of the tangent line of that curve, which should be exactly equal to the directional derivative. To see the particulars, we'll go through this calculation. We'll begin, of course, with the derivative This will be the limit as h goes to 0 of f of x. Now, we're evaluating this at 0, so it's going to be 0 plus h times u minus f of x plus 0 times u, that's just f of x, all over h. And that is exactly the definition of the derivative, the directional derivative at x. And so it is in fact true, and it makes good geometric sense. This fact is going to help us derive a formula that will help us easily calculate directional derivatives. Let's pursue this a little bit. What happens if we take the derivative of f of x plus tu 
evaluated at t equals zero. Now, to carry out this computation, we'll suppose that x is the vector xy, u is the vector u1, u2, so that x plus t times u is x plus t times u1, comma, y plus t times u2. The chain rule says that we first take the derivative of f with respect to the x coordinate and then multiply it by the derivative of x with respect to t. But that's u1. We also have to take the derivative of f with respect to the y coordinate and multiply by dy dt, which is u2. And so we end up with the partial derivative of f with respect to x evaluated at x times u1, plus the partial derivative of f with respect to y evaluated at x times u2. Now, what we have here looks a lot like a dot product. It looks like the dot product of the vector df dx, df dy, and here I'm suppressing the functional dependence on the position x, dotted with the vector u1, u2. And this is going to give us an easy way to calculate these directional derivatives. First, I'll make a definition. The gradient of f is denoted by, now I have to be honest, there are a couple different common notations. One is grad of f or this symbol here. This is called nabla. It is also called del. It represents an upside down delta. But in our context, it represents the gradient of the scalar valued function f. And defined by del f, the gradient of f is the vector of partial derivatives. If we had independent variables x, y, and z, we would have three partial derivatives and three coordinates. Notice that the gradient gives you a vector. You start with a scalar valued function little f, you calculate the gradient, and it gives you a vector. A vector with as many coordinates as you have in the domain. Now, we have a theorem. The theorem is really an observation from our last calculation that the directional derivative is the gradient dotted with the vector u. So let's do an example. Let's suppose that f is given by z equals f of x comma y, which is x squared plus y squared. Do you recognize what kind of surface that is? z to the power 1. Squares over here. It's some kind of paraboloid. The signs are the same. It is an elliptic paraboloid. Now, the gradient of f in this case, first you take the derivative with respect to x. Then you take the derivative with respect to y. Let's suppose that u is the vector 1 half square root of 3 over 2. So this is the direction we're going to take the directional derivative. And let's suppose that the point x 
is the point 1, 2. Here's the way you calculate the directional derivative. First, you evaluate the gradient at the point 1, 2. That's going to be 2, comma 4. And we dot that with the directional vector, 1 half root 3 over 2. And so we end up with 1 plus 2 times the square root of 3. That will be the slope of the tangent line as we move in the direction of the vector 1 half root 3 over 2 when we are located at the point 1, 2. We not only have the new object, the directional derivative, we also have another new object, the gradient. And it would be nice to know something geometric about this gradient. So we have the following theorem. Let f be differentiable at x, 1. Let's say at x, naught. If the gradient at x, naught equals 0, the 0 vector, one must always wonder which 0 we're talking about now, then the directional derivative of f at x naught will be the scalar zero for all unit vectors u. So the directional derivative will be zero in every direction, provided the gradient is the zero vector, two. The direction of maximal increase of f. What direction do you go for steepest ascent on this surface? The answer is the direction of the gradient. Also, the maximal directional derivative is the norm of the gradient. The theorem continues. The direction of steepest descent is minus the gradient. The minimal directional derivative is the minus the norm of the gradient. We should be a little clearer about this. If we have some surface and you're located at some point and you want to know what direction you should go for steepest descent, it will follow the gradient. But remember the gradient, if your function has only two variables, has only two coordinates. It will be a vector parallel to the x, y plane. It will poke into the surface in the direction you should go to get to the top fastest. If you're standing here on the surface with your toes pointing at the steepest slant, then when you hold a, if you hold a broomstick in the direction that you're pointing yourself, horizontal, horizontal, then you will go this direction up to the top of the surface, but this will poke horizontally into the surface. In other words, if this is your surface and you're standing here, the gradient will go this way while you go this way. The gradient is not tangent to the surface. It's perfectly horizontal always at all points as you move on that surface. Let's prove this. 
The first part is obvious because if the gradient is the zero vector, the directional derivative will be that zero vector dotted with u, which gives you the zero scalar. So that's obvious. For the second and third parts, we'll use the fact that u dot v is norm u, norm v, times the cosine of the angle theta between u and v. So, we're going to have grad f dot u, that's going to be the norm of grad f, times the norm of u, times the cosine of the angle theta between. Now, and note that cosine is between 1 and negative 1. So, this expression in the middle, noting that u has a norm of 1, is no bigger than the norm of the gradient of f and no smaller than minus the norm of the gradient of f because cosine is between negative 1 and 1. So the maximal directional derivative will be the norm of the gradient and the minimum will be minus the norm of the gradient. For what values of theta do these maximal and minimal values occur? The maximum occurs when theta is equal to zero. If theta is equal to zero, then u points in the same direction as the gradient. If theta is equal to pi, cosine becomes minus one, where you get the minimum. But if theta is equal to pi, then u points in the opposite of the direction of the gradient. And that ends the proof for parts two and three. Suppose we have ourselves a lab stand and maybe a Bunsen burner with a flame coming up. It's going to have a temperature distribution, let's say on a copper sheet. Let's also suppose that we have ourselves a bug right here. That's a little antenna poking up. And let's suppose the bug is at the point x naught equals, let's say, 2, 1. What direction should the bug go to cool off as quickly as possible if the temperature distribution is 400 minus 20x squared minus 30y squared? The gradient of the temperature distribution will point in the direction of maximal increase in temperature. If the bug follows the gradient, it will fry most quickly, but it will cool off most quickly by going in the direction of the negative of the gradient. We need to calculate the gradient. The gradient will be minus 40x minus 60y. And if we evaluate the gradient, at the point 2, 1, we get minus 80, comma, minus 60. The negative of the gradient, the direction the bug should go, would be 80, 60. Now, normally, directional vectors are unit vectors. We would normally have to normalize this vector. But we can save ourselves that step by saying, The bug should go in the direction of the vector 80, 60, i.e. normalize that and that's the directional vector. Now, another important aspect of the gradient, besides pointing in the direction of maximal increase on some surface, if you have a level curve on a surface, the gradient will always point at a right angle to the level curve. If we were to look at this top down, the level curve, the gradient would be normal to the level curve.
if the surface is given by z equals f of x comma y, a level curve is of the form c equals f of x comma y. This gives you an implied ability to solve for y as a function of x, but we can parameterize that level curve. Let x of t, y of t, parameterize c equals f of x comma y. In other words, if you evaluate f at x of t, y of t, you get c for all t. Then 0 will be the derivative of f of x of t, y of t. And here we use the chain rule. You get df dx dx dt plus df dy dy dt. And that is the dot product of the gradient and the velocity vector dx dt dy dt. So we have 0 equals the gradient of f dotted with the derivative of the position vector. That is a tangent vector to the curve. When you dot product two vectors and get 0, what does that mean about their geometric relationship? The gradient and this tangent vector are orthogonal. And that is the end of the proof. Because as you move around in that level curve, these tangent vectors will be at a right angle to the gradient. As a quick example, Suppose we have the level curve 0 equals f of x comma y equals y minus the sine of x. Or just the sine curve. Let's calculate the gradient. The derivative with respect to x will be minus cosine of x. The derivative with respect to y is 1. Let's evaluate this gradient at various points along the curve, and then see the geometric relationship between this level curve and the gradient. If x is equal to 0, cosine of 0 is 1. We get minus 1, 1. And you can see that the gradient here is at a right angle to the curve. Let's plug in pi over 2. The cosine of pi over 2 is 0, so we just get 0, 1. At pi, cosine of pi is negative 1. Negative, negative 1 will be positive 1, 1. And at 3 pi over 2, cosine is 0 again, getting 0, 1. And then at 2 pi, cosine of 2 pi is 1, we'll get negative 1, 1 again, pointing this way. At each point along the curve, the gradient was normal to the level curve. If you have a higher dimensional setting, if you have a level surface, then the gradient will still be normal, but normal to the level surface. So if you have some level surface like this, the gradient will be normal to the surface. I sometimes find this important in calculations involving shock waves. Because shock waves form these surfaces, you can find a normal to the surface by just taking a gradient. As you've seen, this gradient allows you to easily find normals to various kinds of surfaces. Consequently, it makes it easy to find tangent planes as well. In the next section, we talk about tangent planes and
differentials. To start, suppose you have some level surface. You know that if you calculate the gradient at some point, what you'll end up with is a normal vector to the surface. Therefore, the tangent plane, which is always 0 equals n dot x minus x naught, the gradient being derivative of f with respect to x at x naught, derivative of f with respect to y at x naught, derivative of f with respect to z evaluated at x naught, the tangent plane will be 0 equals df dx at x naught, x minus x naught, plus df dy at x naught, times y minus y naught, plus df dz at x naught, times z minus z naught. Let's find the tangent plane to the surface equals 1, x squared over 16 plus y squared over 25 minus z squared at the point four, five, one. You can see that if you plug in four, you get 16 over 16 is one. When you plug in five, 25 over 25, that's one. One plus one is two. Minus one gives you one. So this is in fact a point on this surface. What kind of surface is that? Note that it's equal to one. And we have one minus. So this is a hyperboloid of one sheet. We want to find the tangent plane at a particular point. So to do that, we'll first calculate the gradient. The gradient is going to be x divided by 8, comma, 2y divided by 25, comma, negative 2z. When we evaluate the gradient at the point 4, 5, 1, we'll get the normal vector to the surface. That's going to be 1 half, comma, when we plug in 5, we can cancel a 5 and get 2 fifths, and then minus 2. Remember that the tangent plane is 0 equals n dot x minus x naught. So we get 0 equals 1 half times x minus 4 plus 2 fifths times y minus 5 minus 2 times z minus 1. There's the equation of the tangent plane. We had a formula for the tangent plane before, but only for surfaces of the form z is a function of x and y. We can derive that formula again by moving the z over and making this into a level surface. The normal then will be the gradient evaluated at a particular point. So you'll have df dx at x naught, df dy at x naught, and then minus 1. It follows then that the tangent plane is df dx at x naught times x minus x naught plus df dy at x naught times y minus y naught minus z minus z naught. If you move the z over and distribute the negative, z naught is going to be the function evaluated at x naught. That is your z naught plus df dx at x naught times x minus x naught plus df dy at x naught times y minus y naught. And that's the formula for the tangent plane that we derived before. This is also thought of as a linearization 
of the surface near the point x0. We can do this more generally. The linearization of a function more generally is just f of x0 plus the gradient of f at x0 dotted with the vector x minus x0. So for example, let's suppose we have z equals x squared plus y squared, and we're looking at the point 1, 1, 2. Let's find the linearization. The linearization is given by, first of all, the function evaluated at x equals 1, y equals 1, z equals 2, 1, 1 is 2. We need to calculate that gradient. The gradient will be 2x, 2y, and if you evaluate the gradient at 1, 1, you get the vector 2, 2. So it's plus 2, 2 dotted with the vector x minus x naught. That's going to be x minus 1, y minus 1. So you get 2 plus 2 times x minus 1 plus 2 times y minus 1. And that well, it's the tangent plane, it's the linearization. I now want to talk about differentials. Now, in calculus one, you started off with y equals some function of x. The differential in y was defined to be, which means you're accepting this, f prime of x dx. Then, if dx was a small change in x, you can find or estimate the corresponding small change in y by taking f prime at x times that small change in x. We had something called relative error, which was dy divided by y, which was sometimes more important than the error itself. We can sometimes think of dx as a small error in the value of x, and dy is an estimate for the error in y that results from that small error in x. If I, for instance, shoot a rocket and miss the target by 100 feet, is that good or bad? Well, if I miss the target by 100 feet and it was supposed to go 100 feet, that's pretty bad. But if I miss the target by 100 feet, but it went millions of miles and landed on Mars, that's not so bad. So the error depends upon how far you're going to go. You can see that dy itself is not as meaningful as the ratio dy divided by y. We also have something called percent error. That's dy over y times 100%. So in the case where the rocket missed by 100 feet, when it was supposed to go 100 feet, that would be a 100% error. Now, remember, our linearization looks like this, which let's call this z0. If we move this z over, we'll get a delta z equals df dx at x naught times a delta x plus df dx at x naught times a delta y. We're going to make the following definition. dz is, because I said so, df dx at x naught times dx plus df dy at x naught times dy. We'll assume that dx and dy are small errors in an x and y, and dz is the resulting estimate on the error in z. 
We can think of this in the following way. dz is grad f dotted with dr, where we're thinking of dr as the vector dx dy. I'm going to give you an example that I hope will make you better scientists. Let's suppose that you launch a model rocket. The model rocket goes straight up, and from an observation post some, let's say, 200 meters away, you measure the angle of elevation at apogee, the highest point in the ascent, to be 63 degrees. How high did the rocket go? This is a very simple trigonometry problem. First, define the height to be h. If you take h divided by 200, that's opposite over adjacent. That's the tangent of 63 degrees. So you can easily calculate the height to be the tangent of 63 degrees times 200. Now, the trig functions output unitless ratios. If the distance here is measured in meters, the answer will be in meters. My calculator tells me that we went 393 meters to within decimal rounding. But the real question is, suppose there are errors in these measurements. Don't all measurements involve some measurement error? If you use a measuring rod, isn't it going to be to within plus or minus so many millimeters? Or if you measure the angle, it's going to be to within plus or minus so many degrees. Let's suppose that the rocket drifts around on the way up. So it's going to be plus or minus 20 meters. And also, let's suppose that our angle measurement is only good to within plus or minus 3 degrees. How far off might the height measurement be now? On part B, I want to find the maximum percent error. To do this, we first have to make sure that everything that has error is a variable. So I'm going to describe the angle by a variable named theta and the distance d by a, var by a variable named d. It follows then that h is d times the tangent of theta. So h depends upon two variables, d and theta. It follows then that dh is the derivative of h with respect to d times the error in d plus the derivative of h with respect to theta times the error in theta. The derivative with respect to d is just tangent theta. The derivative with respect to theta is d secant squared theta d theta. We find next the relative error by dividing everything in sight by h. But remember, h is equal to d tan theta. So we'll have tan theta times the change in d divided by d tan theta plus d secant squared theta times the error in theta divided by d tangent theta. We end up with just the relative error in the distance plus secant squared theta over tangent theta times the error in the angle measurement theta. One thing we should note before we move on is that the derivative of tangent is secant squared theta, but only if theta is measured in radians, which means d theta must be measured in radians. We then measure the relative error. The change in d was up to 20 meters. Here we have the secant squared of 63 degrees over the tangent of 63 degrees times the error in the angle theta, which was 3 degrees at most. That means 
3 pi over 180 radians. You must convert that to radians. You can be in whatever mode you want in your calculator for the purpose of calculating the secant or the tangent, but d theta does matter. You have to be, you have to enter radians there. You can see that you're going to get 0.1 or 10 percent percent error out of this distance no matter what, and there's nothing you can do about that. What is the total relative error then? I'm getting a maximum relative error of 0 0.229. If we multiply by 100%, the maximum percent error will be about 22.9%, which is rather poor. Did you think that this would be that bad when we started, that the height measurement, the height calculation, the height calculation of 393 feet would be off by up to 23%. That's pretty sad, isn't it? You may not be able to do anything about the accuracy of your measurement devices, but there might be one more thing you can do. There may be one more lesson that you can learn from this calculation of the relative error. Let's suppose that there's nothing we can do about our measurement devices. They have errors that they have. But there might be something more that we can do. I want to analyze the second term in the relative error on H. In particular, this second term can be thought of as 1 over cosine squared theta times sine theta over cosine theta all times d theta. We can cancel a cosine. We'll have cosine theta times sine theta. Does that remind you of an identity? Do you remember the double angle identity for sine? Sine 2 theta is 2 sine theta cosine theta. We're only missing a 2, so we'll put that in there. We have then the relative error in the height is the relative error in the distance plus 2 divided by the sine of 2 theta times d theta. We can make this as small as possible if we make the sine as large as possible. Fractions get smaller when the denominators get bigger. The biggest the denominator can get is when it equals 1. And it equals 1 when 2 theta is 90 degrees or when theta is 45 degrees. You can see now that our experimental setup is wrong. We were measuring 63 degrees at 200 meters. We should move the observation post further out to a point where we get about 45 degrees. We've estimated that the rocket went 393 meters high. We should move our observation post from 200 meters from the launch site to about 393 meters from the launch site, and that will minimize the contribution to the relative error from the term involving theta. That will make you a better scientist. To understand the limits of your experimental instruments, to try to minimize the relative error in the computations that you make from those instruments. The rocket problem is a great problem, and you can be sure to see it again on the exam. Make sure that you study it in detail.